are fares typically structured? Well, there's a number of different ways that public transportation agencies structures their fares. The simplest way that fares are structured is through flat fare systems. 70% of transit agencies follow this approach. And that's simply, you get on a bus and you pay a dollar. You get on the rail, you pay two dollars, no matter where you're going or when you're going. But this simplification and easy to understand fare structure also has some costs for both the transit operator and the rider. Flat fares will result in higher costs or higher fares relative to service costs for short distance traveler. Those who go two stops pay the same amount for those who go 10 stops. The person taking two stops is subsidizing the higher cost of a longer trip. Those who are unemployed typically take shorter trips than those who are employed and will take a commute trip. Commute trips on public transportation are typically the longest and the most expensive trips. We need the most buses and the most trains operating, the most congested conditions, and going the farther distance with each passenger. So the fares collected from a commuter are typically lower per mile than those who are commuting in off-peak hours. So those who are unemployed typically travel in those off-peak hours. Household members who don't have access to an automobile often take many short trips in addition to longer trips for their commute. And so those shorter trips that they're taking often lead to subsidizing those longer commute trips. And any non-work traveler, those just going a few stops to get groceries or a few stops to meet with a friend, are paying more for that transit ride in general than a commuter. In an equity sense, this means that the least well-off segment of society will cross-subsidize other users. Those who are most dependent on the public transportation system because they have no other mode available to them tend to pay more per mile for transit usage than those who are employed and better off. It discourages short off-peak transit trips, which relative to a transit trip has a high emissions and fuel consumption rate. The second most common way that transit agencies structure their fares is through differentiated or zone-based fares. About 23% of transit agencies take this approach. While this structure can be more equitable, there are still some equity concerns where short distance riders may live close to a zone and cross it and pay a higher fare than those who live farther away from a zone border. So in graduated pricing, fares typically will increase on a per mile basis. But this is very expensive to implement. It means we have to track each mile traveled by each individual traveler. We need technology to swipe in and out of the transit station and technology that will add up that fare on the fly and then charge it to an individual. We also will need ways in which we can advertise that fare to an individual before they board the transit system. The last thing we want is a surprise large fare that doesn't have the money available on that fare card. With differentiated pricing, we also implement time of day or peak pricing. That way we can capture the higher marginal costs of providing that peak hour service. Recall that during peak hours, we typically need more transit vehicles, which means more drivers, and those transit vehicles typically move slower, which means more fuel consumption. So it gets more expensive to provide the same trip during a peak hour than off-peak hours. So in order to recapture that added cost, transit agencies will implement a peak hour pricing model, where they charge a little bit extra for a ride that takes place during specific peak hours. This can be combined with other pricing models, including other peak hour pricing. In Washington, D.C., for example, there's peak of the peak pricing, which means prices are high during a large peak shoulder period from 6 a.m., let's say, to 10 a.m., but prices are even higher for the most in-demand hours in the morning from 8 to 9 a.m. So there's peak on top of peak pricing. This structure tends to be less inequitable than a flat fare structure, but there are still some inequities. Off-peak fares will still cover a higher percentage of overall cost than peak fares do. Here we see how these two fare structures operate. In graph A, flat fares remain flat no matter how far the trip distance, which is the x-axis, goes. 
On the other hand, sectional fares or zonal fares increase each time the rider crosses a particular zone. This increases the cost of the trip as distance increases as well. In graph B, we see the cost per mile for each one of these trips to the individual rider based on trip length. With the flat fares or the solid line here, you see that over time, shorter trips are much more expensive, but per mile decrease significantly. They'll still be a little bit higher than a flat fare, meaning higher revenue for the transit system and a smaller cross subsidization effect. What happens when we choose to switch our fare structures? That doesn't happen very often, but some transit agencies do eventually switch their fare structure. Well, the effect of switching from a flat to peak hour pricing model, the elasticity of an off-peak discount. Instead of charging more for a peak hour trip, you give a discount for trips that occur off-peak there's a 0.667 elasticity, which results in a 10% average increase in ridership over a year. If you add a surcharge, that's a penalty for peak hour travel, then there's a negative 0.268 elasticity, which results in a year of about an 8% decrease in transit ridership. This change in ridership isn't a change in when people will ride, but it typically will either bring new riders to the system under an off-peak discount or send riders to other modes using a peak surcharge. There's been very little switching between peak and off-peak trips as a result of this surcharge, which means we have very little impact on the timing of individuals' travel behavior. Rather, we have an impact on the modes they choose and the impact on fare box recovery. I mentioned this concept without putting a name to it earlier. This is the percent of operating costs that are recovered by a transit agency from the intake of fares. Typically with a peak hour surcharge, we have an increase in fare box recovery. That is the decrease in ridership compared to the additional revenue that's brought in by that fare policy chain is such that we do get more revenue and a smaller drop in rider. Even with a drop in riders, we get more revenue. On the other hand, with an off-peak discount, we typically will see a decrease in fare box recovery. That reflects the idea that riders are just not induced to using public transportation more as a result of a decrease in fares. There have been a multitude of experiments and continue to be experiments with different fare structures. Perhaps the most common is free fares. What we find is by reducing fares to a free model, we don't see significant increases in ridership. If the transit system wasn't already offering a good alternative to the car, making it cheaper or free doesn't really change the structure of the value proposition of public transportation. So there's typically a high cost associated with dropping fares to free, which means all of that fare box recovery goes away and revenue must come from many other sources. Some transit agencies will give free fares for downtown trips on their public transportation systems, and that typically will have better results. These cities have seen significant increases in ridership on their public transportation system in the downtown area as a result of free fares in that location. They're typically picking up tourists and others who don't want to pay for a transit card or have much investment in the public transportation system, but are happy to hop on and hop off at no additional cost. Luxembourg is a small country. It's about 50 miles by 35 miles with just over 600,000 people living in it. And here in the capital Luxembourg city, around 200,000 people commute into work every day, half from outside the country, but less than 20% of them travel by public transit. But from Sunday, March 1st, all public transit in the entire country will be free. Pretty soon there'll be no ticket machines, unless you want an international ticket. Uh, there'll be no fare dodgers, unless you count people who are sneaking into the first class train cabins that you will still have to pay for. And on the face of it, free public transit seems like an easy decision. Get people out of cars and into buses and trains. But it's a little more complicated than that. We are the country beside Qatar with the highest degree of cars per household in Luxembourg. And we have definitely a big problem, in the, especially in peak hours, with uh, enormous congestion problems. 
We have a problem also that quality of life in our cities, in our villages, it's really worsened. That comes because Luxembourg is a country where you had not only the highest average of economic growth in the last 25 years, but also our population growth is the highest in the European Union. Having a mobility behavior that is mainly based on individual cars cannot really function anymore. And at the end, it's also a problem then for our economy itself. Making public transit free is not a new idea. There are quite a few cities around the world who've already done it, and a lot of Estonia now has free public transit for residents. Luxembourg, though, is the first country to abolish fares entirely. And partly that's because it can afford to do it. The country's a small, rich tax haven. The thing is, public transit here is almost free already. A ticket valid for a full day on every bus, tram and train in the country is €4. Euro. The whole transit network costs the government €700 million Euro a year to operate, but all the tickets sold add up to just 10% of that. By comparison, London's transit network is about half funded by fares. So from the Luxembourg government's perspective, there's not actually that much difference between a €4 Euro day ticket and free transit. But free transit is the sort of headline that gets you a lot of good publicity. But hey, if the transit is free, why would you want to get around by car? Well, it's because the transit here isn't great. It's okay by European standards. The buses and trains will get you there. I've had no problems as a tourist, but the commuter lines are already overcrowded in rush hour. A lot of the rolling stock is dated and there is a litany of complaints about the paths they take and how they deal with breakdowns. Driving here, even with the congestion, is usually quicker and more convenient, sometimes even for journeys directly between city centres. So every year there's more and more people moving here and the infrastructure system is under a lot of strain. So the needs are to make it work, not to make it free. There's lots of research on this. And what comes out over and over again is that fare is not the main motivating factor. The motivating factor is comfort, reliability, and safety. No one never knows if the trains are actually going to be on time. It has happened that people are standing for an hour and a half on the platform waiting for the train with no substitute buses or anything. So that's an extreme case, obviously. But if one wants to be somewhere on time, one has to take this into account that these things do happen. The cities who are doing this, investing in the public transport, the free public transport, that will be the cities that, from a competitive point of view, will be worldwide the winning cities. Even if I say it's free to use, somebody pays it. So at the end, the 700 million euros will be paid by the taxpayers in general. Someone, for example, with a minimum uh, income pays no taxes. So, so he has the public transport really for free. But somebody who pays high taxes, he pays much more. That's an important point. For someone like me, who's a tourist with a travel budget, four euro for a day pass isn't a big issue. But for someone on minimum wage who has to commute an hour or two hours from wherever housing's affordable, that makes a big difference. I don't think the key social issue in, in Luxembourg is the price of the transit. One needs to look at the housing costs. The increasing prices of housing are pushing people to the border regions. So it might be financially more sound to live in Belgium or France or Germany, buy a house or rent a house and buy a couple of cars than it would be to live here in Luxembourg and use the transit. It needs investment and it needs investment now. It's behind. And so Luxembourg needs to catch up and plan for the future. You must see the, the free public transport additionally to the investments that we are doing in the improvement of the network and the quality of the public transport. If you only introduce free public transport, that will change not uh, very much in the behaviour. It can only function if you do it combined with a complete strategy that will switch from individual mobility to multi-modality so even including pedestrians, cyclists, and if you invest at the same time a lot of money in the infrastructure of public transport, so that at the end you can combine everything. We say, if we build an infrastructure, we will build it to move people and not to move cars. I'm not saying free transit is a bad thing. I think it's a great idea, personally. But having good, frequent, well-connected transit that isn't too crowded to board is also important. The question isn't as binary as should public transit be free, because in a utopia of course it would be. It would also be autonomous, zero emission, and it would run from anywhere to everywhere all the time. But until we're in a post-scarcity society, the public are paying, one way or another, either through taxes or fares. The more important question 
is about planning and long-term investment. Because if your bus is always late and your train's always cancelled, it really doesn't matter if they're free. So setting fares and the implications for changing fares are not a straightforward process. There's a lot to consider when thinking about changing the price of a transit trip.